Hello everybody and welcome. As many of you will know, our lunchtime art lectures proved so popular over the summer that Robert Orme has very kindly agreed to host a new series of five art lectures this term titled Magical Art. The first of these talks is on art and traditional magic, where Robert will look at how art has represented the ideas of astrology, alchemy and medicine. If you joined us last term, you will know that these talks helped to raise money for the bursary in Robert's name. Last week, we welcomed back our students on site, which included the third beneficiary of this bursary to Latimer. She is an extremely creative and talented artist. So thank you very much for your donation at registration. Every single gift really does make a difference. Okay, a couple of house rules. Everyone will be on mute so you can all hear the presentation clearly. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat facility and Robert will answer as many of these as time allows at the end of his talk. So on to today's talk. We are delighted and honored to have Robert back with us this term. Robert taught history, history of art and cricket at Latimer for 47 years and is fondly remembered here by staff, pupils and parents. So without further ado, please, please join me in welcoming Robert Orme for today's lunchtime lecture, Art and Traditional Magic. I must first confess that I have no kind of belief whatsoever in any form of magic or cult or even anything spiritual. Uh, I have read an overdose of 18th century rationalism and materialism. I have therefore naive views about how actually science is the way to understand what happens in the world and that magic is basically a series of mistaken beliefs based on false logic and lack of scientific method. And some of you might even remember that when I was first doing general studies in the 60s at Latimer uh, to the A-level students, uh, I was a devout Freudian. And therefore, I also take up a Freudian psychoanalytical point of view where I regard magic as being basically a form of wish fulfillment. But just because I don't believe in it at all is why I find it fascinating to study it in the past when I would claim that most people did actually have a magical view of the universe and their lives and how an important part it played in what they did and what they believed. And therefore, they developed systems of symbols and art which expressed these kind of beliefs. And that is what these talks are going to explore. And we're gonna to start today with alchemy and therefore consider, if you go onto the screen, the kind of artwork that was produced by the artists working for alchemists in the 16th century. Um, they believed that alchemy was possible. They thought that alchemy could indeed transmute things into gold, though alchemy wasn't only a, a sort of uh, sort of fake con way of making money. It wasn't just the sort of fairy story that you get in children's literature today. It was genuinely a precursor of chemistry and it involved all sorts of genuine experiments. It involved all sorts of complicated intellectual understanding and belief and therefore could easily impress rulers. Because if you think back to Theresa May's magic money tree, any ruler, any politician, is going to be very keen to actually acquire the skills and knowledge and secrets of someone like an alchemist who might make them rich overnight with gold. And therefore, the patrons of alchemists provided, as we shall see, laboratories. They also paid for elaborate kind of manuscripts. So if you're on screen and looking at the first of the manuscripts, the um, the idea was that these are very valuable secrets and therefore they couldn't just be painted in naturalistic form and they didn't use the chemistry system of symbols and signs and instead they produced these incredible manuscripts of very lavish style, style with very beautiful images. Uh, I can't see on screen. Can you have? Yes, there. This is a manuscript in Bishop Library, one of the most famous alchemical manuscripts. It's called Splendor Solis, Splendor of the Sun. And it was created in Germany in the 1530s. And it shows you how much money must have been paid to get these magnificent uh, manuscripts produced. And you can see at the bottom 
the people who are involved. Then you have all these alchemical symbols and it's a whole stunning series of pictures. So if you move on there, you can see how uh, it's actually making use of the Renaissance theories of realism and perspective, how this is a skillful artist who's been employed to show these alchemical symbols with the peacock in the alchemist's alembic or vase. And if you look at the next one here, you can see how it uses perspective, it uses colour, it represents real high quality 16th century German art. And therefore, there are lots in the libraries of the world of these fantastic illuminated manuscripts of alchemical ideas. And the ideas are often very complicated and to maintain their secrecy, to make them occult, they often were done in symbolic form. And therefore, these manuscripts contain all sorts of strange images like this. This means that in the 20th century, the surrealists got very interested in alchemy because the alchemists were doing these symbols of, as you can see, different planets and different uh, signs of the zodiac and different elements and so on. But although that is what they were actually doing, what they did were from their imagination create these absolutely fantastic surreal kind of images, which meant that various of the surrealists uh, got interested in alchemy, looked at alchemical manuscripts, and therefore alchemy has played quite a large part in art. And what we're going to do now is to look at the different types of alchemy that were shown in art. Uh, the basic belief of alchemy was that it should be possible because of the four elements. They date back to pre socratic times. And what you've got here is a diagram and it says in the Latin on the outside, omnis creatura, all creation. And as you probably know, uh, all creation was supposed to have been made by God from the four elements, fire, water, air and earth. And when you look at the way it's done, you have the elements, but they're definitely shown, aren't they, as interlocking symbols. And the idea of having them as interlocking symbols was that this is actually how everything was originally created, from a mixture of the four elements. So something like iron, was hard and therefore basically earth. If it was tin and it was lighter than lead, it had more air in it. Uh, it could become a liquid, so it must have water. And obviously it glowed red hot with fire uh, when in a furnace. And therefore everything that was created could be explained as a mixture of the four elements. And the next diagram shows you the, sorry, the, the next picture shows you the way in which uh, alchemists took advantage of these ideas because if everything is made from the four elements then anything can turn into anything else and it only needs a process of addition and, and, and subtraction and this is a painting in the 16th century about 1570 from Florence by Jacopo Stradano and it shows an alchemist laboratory and the figure bottom right is Francesco de Medici who as a duke paid for the setting up of a big alchemical laboratory and below in the next picture you see what was called his studiolo which was the uh, room completely blocked off from the rest of the Palazzo Vecchio in which he had a wunderkammer in which he kept his jewels, his chemicals, his magical manuscripts and then on the walls all these paintings which are of mythological subjects and also of the different crafts and sciences one of which was alchemy. So if you look again at the Stradano, you can actually see how basic elementary alchemy worked. So look at the Stradano, the previous picture, the previous picture there, and you can work out what is going on. Uh, in the very centre, you can see one of the things that was actually developed and invented by alchemists. It's a still, isn't it? Because if you're going to actually remix the elements to create something else, you've got to have pure water. So this is a distillation process where you can get pure water. Then as you can see on the left, you see there is a press and in the press they've actually put plants because things like minerals and vegetables were actually going to be interchangeable. And the man pulling the lever is crushing the plant, a liquid comes out of it, but what is left is then going to be a kind of powder and the powder, they would say, is the pure earth that had been taken up by the plant when it was growing. And then if you're the duke, you can literally have a frying pan 
to create gold or other things because you've got the duke at the bottom right with his frying pan the alchemist is advising him behind him and he is literally stirring a frying pan over heat so he's adding fire and if you actually add all the correct mixture of fire out there and water then you can change one thing into another thing and often in their chemical experiments when using heat and so on they saw they saw metals that were solid become liquid they saw things change color they saw all these kind of chemical miracles going on which they didn't understand but which confirmed them in their belief and this is the failure of their scientific method if you do a million experiments and fail to produce gold if you're a scientist you think there must be something wrong with the theory but they weren't being scientific they had this belief from the bible and ancient philosophy that everything was the four elements and therefore alchemy should be possible so that's painting showing one kind of rather elementary kind of uh, alchemy but there was another type of way of transforming things through what is now the popular image of alchemy in jk rowling and so on which is the philosopher's stone so if you look at this diagram you'll see this, which says at the center, Lapis Philosophorum. And as it says Lapis Philosophorum, it means the substance which is going to be capable of, when added to other things, transforming them and changing them. And you can see from the diagram labeling that it has actually got at the center Lapis Philosophorum. It has the words activa and passiva, active and passive. Then in the octagon around it, it's got calidus, and it's then got frigida, and water and earth, and therefore the four elements. And therefore, the philosopher's stone is going to take the four elements, which are the corners of the square. They're going to take the triangle, which, as you can see, actually links into the moon and the sun and a planet. And the idea was that if you get the correct mixture of all the basic things of creation, the elements and the rays of the stars, and you mix them together correctly, you create a Lapis Philosophorum, which is the magical power to transform and change things. This basic idea has a very simple metaphorical kind of existence. The alchemists actually wrote how these magical beliefs are a metaphorical, symbolic way of talking about their chemistry. And they didn't necessarily literally believe what we're about to see, but they did believe that it was a good metaphor for how alchemy could actually work. Because you've got this diagram which shows the Lapis Philosophorum. The next diagram shows again the Lapis Philosophorum, and it says salt, sulfur, and mercury, and it's showing the mixture. But as you can see in the center, it has the word semen. And therefore, in magical systems, you often use animism, you animate the world, and you believe that the relationship between physical material things, the chemicals, is actually the same and like actually the relationship between living things and humans. And therefore, they were seeking what was thought to be the perfect solution to the alchemist problem, this seminal kind of philosopher's stone that would produce the magic effects they wanted. So the next picture is labeled perfect solution. And it has, as you can see, an alchemist vase, an alembic, floating in the alembic of four heads, which are presumably uh, the four elements. And then if you look at the bottom of the alembic, do you see how there are actually two naked couples having sex? And this alembic is in a distinctly womb-like kind of shape. And then at the top, in the vagina, the neck, you see a baby is emerging and then from the top emerge these flowers and in the original manuscript uh, they are covered with gold and therefore this is an allegorical al an alchemical allegory of how actually the world can be reproduced by alchemists using the philosopher's stone and the next alembic is one with a little man in it and what appear to be kind of semen floating around, which are going to rise up and give birth to some new kind of chemical compound. Then you get a book like this, which is about actually alchemical technique, and it has in it this mysterious diagram 
where on the left you can see these alchemical vessels or vases or alembics. And when you look at them, you can see, first of all, that they are definitely womb shaped. They have a tunnel at the top, which is vaginal. And then they have these spouts that come out and project. And you can see how conscious the analogy was because next to this alchemical equipment, what you've actually got is a pair, a couple blending together and having sex and producing a baby. And therefore you've got this system of alchemy where it developed its own kind of art. It developed these beautiful manuscripts. It developed these strange ideas and it put them into these symbolic forms, which have later so appealed to the surrealists. But alchemists got a bad reputation. If you look at the next picture, which is a print by Peter Bruegel, this will remind you of that Ben Johnson play, uh, The Alchemist, because by the end of the 16th century uh, and then through to the 17th century, although alchemy continued to be used and believed, Newton was an alchemist, uh, it was also at the time much criticized and satirized. So what you've got here in this Bruegel print is an alchemist on the right, he's an old man, he's got all these manuscript books in front of him, he spent his whole life studying alchemy. Then on the left he's got his assistant who is actually mixing the various different chemicals and minerals together at a very chaotic desk with bellows to add air, with fire to add heat, uh, with all sorts of ingredients that can be put together. But if you look, the whole laboratory is in total chaos. Uh, he is living in complete poverty because you can see how uh, the wife in the center has got in her hands her purse and she's trying to empty the purse onto the floor and it shows that no coins come out. And then if you look at the top center, do you see their children are actually climbing into a cupboard looking for food? Because this is the paradox of alchemy. If alchemy were true, and they controlled the amount of gold they made, then alchemists should be the richest people in the world. But really, as you can see, the alchemist is living in poverty, and the implication of the print is that he's led his whole life following a delusion. And you can see just below him to the left to see there is a fool with the bellows blowing up his importance. And therefore, you get in the picture top right, looking through the window, to see his wife and children have to leave the alchemist because he's completely poor. And they go and look for uh, hope in a nunnery to bring up their family. Therefore, by the 17th, 18th centuries, you obviously got the end of belief in alchemy, you got the development of chemistry, and you got people being very sceptical, so that in the Ben Johnson play, The Alchemist, uh, the alchemist is not only deluding himself, but he's also trying to delude everybody else. And therefore, alchemists ended up with the reputation of being con men, confidence tricksters, and therefore alchemy lost its role as a central belief in the scientific world. But by the end of the 18th century, in this painting by Wright of Derby, you get a change of attitude towards alchemy in the late 18th century. This is a highly realistic painting by Wright of Derby, who specialized in tenebrism, these dark scenes, and then these fantastic illuminations. And this shows you a new romantic interest in alchemy. It's in a Gothic kind of horror kind of building. It's going to appear in alchemy in lots of the kind of stories. Um, alchemists believe that with the Philosopher's Stone, they could create a little man, a homunculus, and therefore is the background to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein kind of myths. And therefore, alchemy became popular in terms of actually, first of all, belief, because this is the end of the 18th century, when there were all sorts of Freemasonry, Rosicrucian and Illuminati societies who believed in alchemical ideas. And then there were also all these writers and painters who believed that alchemy made a really good gothic mystery kind of subject. And this one has got a slightly more complicated implication because when it was produced in 1771, it was entitled The Alchemist, but The Alchemist Discovering Phosphorus. And what Wright has done is to show an alchemist doing experiments and then by chance coming on something real. 
Whereas inside his glass vase, you see the enormous light that comes out. And this is him allegedly discovering phosphorus and its power of illumination. And therefore, he's not disrespecting alchemy. He is saying that alchemy is actually the forerunner of genuine chemical experiments. And then if you look at the figure there, you see the figure is kneeling as if actually in awe of Christ, of God, and the wonder and awe of alchemy is something that really impressed the Romantics. So arguably, alchemy was a very important part of the worldview of lots of learned people all the way through to the 18th century and had lots of influence on the way that you could paint paintings. One of the other main beliefs was going to be in astrology. And if you look therefore at the image of the universe as it was conceived from the time of Ptolemy through to the 18th, sorry, 17th um, century, what you've got here is a 17th century print of the Ptolemaic universe. And it is of course wrong because it is geocentric. The little center of it is the earth because it is the origin of God's creation. And then around it, you can see the seven rings of the um, planets and then the outermost ring is going to be the stars which create the zodiac and these rings were genuinely thought to exist they had to be drawn like this in a map but they were the crystal spheres they were the system of crystal rings which held planets and zodiac in their place in the constellations of the sky as they changed through the year and they were crystal because they were solid but they were going to be invisible and therefore what you've got is this complete view of the universe and how it worked but this is not astronomy this is astrology because the belief in astrology was that actually the things in the sky are going to have an enormous influence on the earth and as well as the planets which we'll look at you also have these fantastic maps that were produced of the zodiac and zodiac mythology goes back to ancient Babylonian times linking different patterns in the sky to stars and therefore creating this fabulous mythology of all the different signs of the zodiac which was supposed to have such an influence on everything that happened on this earth in the world and therefore you've got these astrologers not just believing that this is the system of how the universe worked but also believing in the influence of the stars. So if you look at this strange image of, no, the next one is the, go to the next one. If you look at this strange image here of the um, astrologer, he is living on earth, isn't he? But you see, he literally penetrates through the stars to the outer rings of the universe. And therefore astrologers know about what is going to happen on earth because what is happening on earth is influenced by, caused by, and if you're a real astrologer you might even believe determined by, though that wasn't what the Christian church thought, um, it had a determining influence on what happened on earth. And this is not an illogical thing to actually believe. If you actually stand on this earth and you look at the sun moving round, the automatic logical thing to believe is that we are standing still and the sun is the center, the earth is the center of the universe and the sun goes round the earth. So the most logical thing for them to believe was a geocentric universe. And then if you look at the top, you can see there's a moon and everybody had known for millennia that the moon was linked to the tides and the phase of the moon coincided with the movement of water on earth and the tides. And then you've got the sun and the sun sends down rays and the sun is obviously linked to the element of fire and these rays hit the tree in the center and a tree in the center changes through the year as the sun warms up in the spring miraculously leaves appear when the sun gets cooler in winter the leaves disappear therefore the sun and its rays are the cause of what is happening in vegetable life so therefore it was entirely logical to believe that everything was going to be influenced by rays coming down from all these different stars and 
planets and influencing what happened on Earth. And this was a very widespread belief. If you go back to the diagram of the universe, you can see this is a diagram of the four elements and each of the planets in particular was linked to a different element. But it also says, doesn't it, mundus annus homo. Mundus means world or universe, which is linked to the elements and the stars. And then it says annus because the year is linked as well. So if you go to the most famous manuscript produced in the 15th century, which is the Très Richeur of the Duc du Berry, who was the son of the King of France and lived in uh, France and Burgundy in the early 15th century. This is produced about 1412 or so by a series of brothers, the Limbaugh brothers, and some later artists. But basically, this is an illustration of how central to everybody's lives were the beliefs in astrology. Because this is a book of hours. A book of hours is the most common form of medieval manuscript, and it consists of texts of the Bible, psalms, prayers, and so on, that should be said every day at particular hours of the day to the year. And therefore, the opening of the Tre Richeur, which we're looking at here, is, as you can see, going to actually be a calendar. And there is this series, fabulous series, of 12 pictures of the different months of the year and how they actually influence lives. In this one, you have probably a real castle, and then you have the life of the peasants in the fields. In the previous one, you've got the uh, duke himself uh, giving a feast. Uh, and then above them, as you can see, you have these circular designs. And these circular designs were all about the way in which, according to the movements of the sky through the year, at each point in the year, there were going to be different part angles of the sun, there were going to be different stars in the sky, different signs of the zodiac rose above the horizon, and therefore each month was going to be different. So you get a whole series. Next one. And uh, therefore you get this whole series where each month is given its activities and also the signs of the zodiac that control things like the weather and the way of life on earth. And this is a really precious manuscript that would have been in the Duke's private collection, which he kept in a chapel in one of his castles. But it also had a big influence in Italian Renaissance art. And if you go to Ferrara and you look at the Palazzo Schifanoia, you should find, sorry, I, I mistook leaving this one out. I'm going to stay on the Zodiac Man. Uh, as well as the images of the months, there is also this magnificent image of the so-called Zodiac Man, where you can see the ring of the signs of the zodiac around, and then you have the bodies of a man and a woman, beautifully painted with the different signs of the zodiac all over their body. And this is not a surreal image, but this is a medical image. This is actually one of the bases of most medicine up until the 18th century, where along with the elements uh, causing um, you to be ill, because disease was a wrong mixture of fire, earth, air, and water, it was also going to be caused by the rays of the different signs of the zodiac and the planets. So, as we know, you talk about an illness called influenza, and influenza is the influence of the stars. And the most famous, most obvious, is cancer the crab, gives its name to the appearance of cancers, particularly, I think, in this one in the chest area of the body. And therefore, this is actually showing how these ideas of astrology penetrated into medicine. And what you've got here is something that appeared in doctors' manuscript notes. They had manuscripts which explained how each of these signs of the zodiac influenced a different part of the body. And the rays could be good or they could be bad. Good rays meant that that organ became very healthy. Bad rays, evil rays, would actually cause problems. So therefore, uh, this notion of astrology was not only part of everyday life, but also part of um, medicine. Now, as well as these manuscripts of um, their beliefs, you also had in Italy in the Renaissance, lots of big astrological schemes. So if you look at the Palazzo Schifanoia in Ferrara, 
This was a country house built for the Este family. And it has a series of large frescoes on the walls, which illustrate, again, the different months of the year. And you can see at the top, mythological themes. The top one is a chariot of Venus. And then on the bottom, you can see a group of courtiers in their best clothing, uh, behaving in the ways that are influenced by the planet Venus at this time of year. And then in the centre, you see there's a whole band of these astrological figures, so that Venus in this one is linked to, in the dead centre, you see there is Taurus the bull, which is the sign of the zodiac. And therefore there are lots of these large uh, astrological schemes that became part of Italian Renaissance art in the 15th and 16th centuries. But the most clear way in which actually you could see the influence of uh, astrology was in the belief in horoscopes. And when you look at this picture, you've got a 16th century print of a woman giving childbirth to see how she's sitting on a birth stool and she's been helped by midwives. But in the background, you've got two astrologers who are looking up into through the window into the starry sky. And then you see they're drawing a map on the table and the map will have on it what were the particular stars and signs of the zodiac that had just risen freshly above the horizon at the very moment when the baby was born. And the theory was that you received a kind of signature, a, a sigil, a seal that was marked into you at your birth by the very first rays and influences of the planets and zodiac that hit you when you were born. They thought of the baby as having very soft flesh. If it's got very soft flesh, then actually the rays can penetrate more easily than they can that of a hardened adult. Also, the top of the baby's head has a hole in it. And that's literally where rays are going to come down from the fresh new stars with their biggest influence that go straight into your head and therefore condition, or as some astrologers said, determine what your character is going to be. And therefore, our uh, astrology became very much a psychological system. Each of these different signs of the zodiac was going to actually have an impact, imprint of a different kind of character on your psychology. And this is shown in this series of illustrations from a 15th century manuscript of a poem by Leonardo Dati, De Sfero, on the spheres, where the illustrations are showing you the way in which actually they had a very strong belief in Renaissance Italy in the influence of the stars on all the things that you did. So very obviously this is Mars. Mars is named as a god of war, so he's a soldier. And also uh, it's thought that Mars got tended to get linked to war because it's a so-called blood red planet. Is that the red of blood or is it the red of fire? But either way, it was supposed that if you were born under the fresh influence of Mars, together with Scorpio, which is the circle to the left, or to uh, Aries the Ram, which is on the right, have a mixture, a conjunction of rays from all those three things, the planet Mars and the two signs of the zodiac, they will get inside your head and therefore you can see on Earth you are going to actually literally become a soldier you're going to become a fighter, it's going to become wars. And it is actually true that sometimes, as in, for example, China as well, even in Renaissance Italy, there were rulers and generals who consulted astrologers as to when were going to be propitious moments to launch things like wars. And it even appears in some influence on perhaps Hitler and his circle in the SS. The next picture is uh, of Jupiter and again you can see Jupiter is linked to Pisces and to Sagittarius and Jupiter is another Latin name for Jove and of course the word Jove gives us the modern word jovial and to us jovial simply means happy but you can see why it's come to mean happy when you look at this picture here because you have the planet and it's looking down onto a group of uh, Renaissance merchants, each of them in a workshop, uh, busily selling goods to their customers. And therefore, 
being born under Jupiter was supposed to be very auspicious. He's the chief of the gods and he was supposed to bring you good luck. And therefore, if you were born under Jupiter, then the astrologer said that you were going to have a successful, and in the case of these merchants, um, a rich kind of life. But if you, on the other hand, valued other things in life, you might prefer perhaps to have been born under Venus. And you've got the planet Venus there. You've got then uh, Aries the Ram, which sounds rather lustful, but you've got to balance it. So you've got Libra on the other side. And therefore you've got the naked goddess Venus, the planet Venus, sending down rays to Earth. And look where the rays come from. Do you see how they are literally bought, they're literally put into you at birth. And therefore you live your life in a garden of love, a garden of pleasure. And what you've got in the pictures below is this garden where everybody is courting in the traditions of chivalric courtly love. And therefore they had a very strong belief in the way in which the planets and the zodiac influenced everything in your life. The zodiac man showed how your physical health was influenced by the stars. Then the planets had not only an influence on your physical health, but also on your melancholy, but also on your mental state. And one of the worst things to be was to be a lunatic. And when you look at this print from 1650, you can see how it says the influence of the moon, and it's an influence, as you can see, particularly on this group of women. And there's lots of mythology where you get women, men linked to the sun and women linked to the moon. And the links to the moon were to do with the way in which they believe that just as there are going to be tides in the oceans created by the moon, so there were going to be tides within women's bodies. And therefore, menstruation was supposed to actually be caused by the moon moving things around inside you. But it also gives us the origin of the word lunacy. And lunacy obviously implies mental illness. And it's thought that the way in which they associated the influence of rays of the moon with your mind were twofold. Uh, first of all, you've got the way in which the moon goes through phases and you see a quarter moon, a full moon and so on. And therefore the moon is not static and unchangeable like most of the stars appear to be. It is very changeable. And it's probable therefore that they were thinking of kind of what we would call bipolar mental problems where there are violent mood swings and they were said to be caused by different phases of the moon. And they also had a very strange idea which was that actually the moon moves the tides because its rays are not hot and fiery like the sun but they literally believe that they were wet. Go out in midsummer in the really hot starless uh, starful cloudless sky and you'll see the moon full moon coming down and then when you go to the grass next morning it's going to be covered with dew isn't it and they literally believed that dew was from the rays of the moon which was a watery kind of planet and was sending down these watery rays that a made women menstruate and b made them unfortunately according to their beliefs literally soft in the head and therefore you've got all these ways in which astrology influenced your actual way of living your bodily health and your psychology there are also all sorts of links between magic and what we would call psychology today if you start to think in terms of what creates psychology you may remember that we've been constantly talking about uh, the four elements. So if you look at this diagram here, we've seen that it influences the world, Mundus. We've seen that the four elements influence Annus, the stage of the year, but it also says Homo, which means the, the four elements are going to have a big influence on your body, because your body is made of fire, air, and water, and an illness is simply too much or too little of different mixtures of these four elements inside you but is also going to, according to some beliefs in the 16th century, determine 
your mental state. Because there's a fantastic series that was rediscovered by the surrealists in the 1930s of anamorphic pictures by Archimboldo. First of all, look at the whole series, fire, then the next one is air, which is birds. That is water, which is fishes. And then that is earth, which is animals. And these are called anamorphic because it's speciality, which became very popular in 16th century Italy, where it was believed that these were incredibly in clever, intelligent, witty ways of doing pictures. And where he therefore specialized in doing pictures where he took things like vegetables and then did paintings that were made from vegetables into, for example, people. But this series in Vienna is definitely about the four elements, but it's also about the psychology of the people. And it's possible that the faces are deliberately meant to actually resemble people at the court of the Emperor Rudolf, uh, who worked, who was based in Prague and who believed very strongly in the occult and patronized lots of alchemists and astrologers as well at his court, but also commissioned um, this kind of series because of course all the things in this are connected with fire. So you've got cannon and you've got um, sparks and you've got flint and the hair is literally flames. Uh, the chin is a lamp, the neck is a candle, therefore everything is to do with fire. And if you think of actually how we talk about personality and psychology today, we're still actually left with a legacy of this vocabulary of what the elements do. You talk about a fiery personality. You talk about the way in which somebody is hot tempered. Uh, whereas we know and use these simply as metaphorical symbolic descriptions, in the 16th century, they were metaphors, they were symbols, but they were literally believed in because the mind was created out of the four elements, fire, earth, air and water. Then if you are born with air, this is the one that shows you made out of birds, this was pretty good because air was associated with uh, being lightheaded. Uh, it was supposed to help your imagination and your ideas to float around. And again, if you talk about lighthearted, it's supposed to be making you relatively happy, isn't it? Therefore, to be an airy personality was perhaps more desirable than being fiery. But you definitely don't want to be called wet because all these fishes are there. And if you were at Latimer in any of the decays between the 60s and now, the word wet was very current in terms of disparaging and bullying kids who are said to be wet. And if you're wet, then you are literally soft because the water added to the earth is going to soften it and you won't be a hard man, you'll be soft, you'll be wet. And therefore you have this particular kind of character type which has got too much water in it. But worst of all probably was if you were at Latima and especially if you're one of the teachers, especially if you're one of the PE teachers, quite frequently you as pupils actually called your PE teachers trying to teach you maths as thickos. And unfortunately, that term thick, which is still current a lot today in schoolboy slang, goes back all the way to this, you're earthy. It could be that you're a hard man. So being earthy could be good if you're going to be a front row forward, say. But sadly, if there is too much earth in your head, they believe that the different parts of your brain the senses, the intelligence, the memory, were connected together by literally tubes. And if there was too much earth in the tubes, then the transit of ideas through your head was slow and you were thick. And therefore you have all these different character types which were based on the four elements. But you've probably heard how the main psychological system was not about the elements, but about the four humours. And this is an idea that goes back to ancient Greece. Uh, it's there in Galenic medicine, and it lasted therefore way through to the 18th century. And there were going to be four basic humours, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. And these were again supposed to be things that determined 
your physical medical health, but also your psychological state. And you can see that they basically derive from the four elements. So there are some of them that are hotter, drier, wetter or colder. And these different kind of uh, humours, as they were called, were going to create different personality types. So if you look at this diagram of a man, he has literally been quartered where you can see that he may be very phlegmatic. And that is because you're pretty wet, because you've got too much sort of liquid in you, too much phlegm. Uh, you might be sanguine, which in modern language means that you're kind of optimistic, but it literally means that you're bloody. And if you're bloody, then that means that you've got lots of life force in you, you're healthy, and therefore it's really good to be a sanguine kind of person. Uh, you might be uh, someone who is a bit um, bilious, and that would not be a good thing, because you know how yellow bile is not like, not nice, and you might have, uh, cause, and that causes too much choler, and you become choleric, and that means that it's to do with anger, doesn't it? And then bottom left, you've got melancholia, melancholic, and that word melancholy has come to have a completely different meaning now than what it used to have in the past. It was, no, stay on the diagram, please. It was literally a one of the four humours, and it was supposed to be too much earth inside you, and it was said to be under the influence, particularly of the heaviest, the biggest of the planets, Saturn, and therefore it might make you a melancholic person. And if you'd lived in the Middle Ages and you were melancholic, that was supposed to be really bad. It was linked to Arcadia, it was linked to laziness, not doing anything, uh, living a very passive kind of life. But in the Renaissance, it's possible that it had a change of meaning and a revaluation, because it famously is the subject of one of Dürer's most wonderful prints, the Melancholia I, which was produced in about the year 1514. And it's a typical melancholic figure, because she's sitting there with her head down, her resting on her hand, the face is in darkness because melancholy tends to be linked to blackness and therefore she may be a typical kind of figure of melancholy. Uh, Dürer's mother had just died that year and therefore it may be literally melancholy in the modern sense and there's a big dispute, everybody disagrees as to what all the different symbols that you can see around in the painting might mean but the study I first read, which I still like and believe in, was written by Erwin Panofsky over the years. And his analysis linked this image to the influence of the ideas of Neoplatonism. Do you remember when we were doing Botticelli, uh, we looked at the influence of Ficino on Botticelli's theory of love? Well, Ficino also had a new idea about melancholy, where he thought that these kind of thoughtful people were going to be the intellectuals. And he argued that the uh, fact that you were thoughtful made you a more clever person, a more intellectual person, and you could get a kind of platonic inspiration from the world around you that made you a leading intellectual. And in Germany in the early 16th century, uh, lots of the ideas of the Neoplatonists and Ficino were promulgated in this book by uh, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, which as you can see is called De Occulta Philosophia, and you've got the German, sorry, the Latin edition that is what was around in Germany in the 16th century on the left, and then you've got three books of occult philosophy translated into English in the 17th century. And in his occult philosophy, he argued that actually melancholy was going to be a good thing to have, and he believed that melancholy was linked not only to the intellect, but also to genius. And he thought that when you are in a situation where you're in melancholy um, um, meditation, he believed that it was actually very strongly going to influence your imagination. And therefore, when you look at the Dura picture, one of the levels of meaning may be that it is literally, as you can see, sadness. But around the figure of melancholy, you have all these other things, don't you? Uh, there are lots of things that are, cons that are linked to uh, masonry and to um, carpentry. But there are also lots of things that are linked to maths and to geometry. And if you look on the wall immediately above her head, you've got one of those magic squares where 
when you add up the numbers crossways and vertically, they always come to the same result and therefore have some kind of magical uh, significance. And the theory was that in your melancholy state, you actually might receive a kind of platonic inspiration from the world's soul and that your imagination was fired. And therefore, this may be an allegory of melancholy a sadness from the way the figure sits, but it may also be an image of artistic creativity. And it may also be an image of actually the way in which beauty can be created by the artist. Because of course, as you know, the Neoplatonic theory was that actually beauty in the human body is to do with proportion and geometry and numbers, as we heard in discussing Ficino. But it also appears in Dürer, who did studies of human anatomy, where he added mathematical proportions that created beauty. Therefore, I think that this may well be a very personal image from Dürer, taking these traditional ideas of melancholy and trying to symbolize his own creativity in the picture. There was another way of reading um, human psychology. And you've probably heard of chiromancy, where actually, if you are believing chiromancy, you can read people's fortunes by looking at the signs in their hands. But there was also a science or magical science of what was called physiognomy. And in Naples, there was a writer, Gian Battista Porta, who produced a book called De Physiognomia. And there he is, and the title page of his book. And this arguably is the basis of a painting in the National Gallery by Titian, which you can see as the three ages of man, where you've got these three disembodied heads, and then underneath you've got these three animals. And it's thought that these, this image may well derive from the ideas of people like Porter. So if you look at the Porter title page, you've got his own portrait done realistically, <clears throat> but then around, you see there are these strange little pictures. And if you go into the book itself, you open it up, you find these incredible surreal images. For example, look at this man with a lion. And the theory, as you can obviously imagine, was that when you look at a human face, you can read the character of the person because the, per the person's face resembles a creature. So this man is literally leonine, isn't he? And has been specially drawn to have a vague resemblance to what is vaguely like a lion. But then you could also be a bit bull and therefore you're going to have this strange man who looks out at you just as the bull is out at you. And he's a bull in a china shop. He looks as though he's going to be very fierce and very angry. And then you can be an old man like this and apparently you look like an owl. And uh, that is probably quite a good thing to look at as you're an old man because the owl is traditionally a symbol of wisdom, foresightedness and so on. Therefore, there was a widespread belief that human physiognomy, the faces, resembled animals and from that you could work out their character. Therefore, if you look at the Titian triple portrait, it's been interpreted again by Panofsky as being a painting produced late in Titian's life. Therefore, the old man on the far left is very definitely a self-portrait of Titian. He didn't have a son, but he had a nephew, which is probably the central figure, and then a great nephew, which is the young man on the right. And Panofsky has argued that this was a kind of statement to his family as to what he was going to do in his will. He'd been very rich and successful in Venice, made lots of money, but he left it all to the nephew and none to the young man. And it's thought that the allegory of the painting may be trying to explain why he did that. Below the old man is a wolf or possibly a fox. And we still talk about cunning as a fox and therefore may be meant to be sort of cunning, but he's giving the money not to the young man, but to the one in the prime of life. So the one in the center is Leonine. He is the man in the prime of life who will actually make good use of the money. Whereas if you look at the young man, Below him, there's not just a, he's not just a dog, but he's also, if you look at the mouth, a panting dog, its tongue is out. And what does to pant for mean? It means that you're continuously seeking for things 
And here's the sort of 16th century warning against youth, which was supposed to lead you into folly, into extravagance, wasting your money. And therefore, it's thought that this is a piece of psychological portraiture where he has tried to actually show the personalities of his family in relation to these animals. So I believe that what we've looked at today shows how fundamental a magical worldview was in every aspect of people's lives. We've seen how alchemy was something that was a serious pseudoscience, was a serious set of experiments and a symbolic worldview. We've seen how astrology is really a form of uh, almost Jungian archetypal uh, psychology. And then we've seen how uh, psychology itself took up magical ideas about what actually created character was the stars, the elements, and then the humours. So what we've done today is to look at kind of some of the most traditional forms of magic and their influence of art. And next week, we're going to look at another thing that played a vital part, a big part in 16th, 17th century belief systems, witchcraft. And we're going to look at the way in which witchcraft was depicted in 16th century art. So thank you for listening. And I'd be very happy to listen to any and have any questions that anybody wanted to ask. Thank you, Robert. I think we've got a question from the other Robert. Um, if Robert's oh, Robert Tay again. Yes. <laughs> yes, again. I'm, I'm here to warn you, Robert. Um, I'm going off to Prague mid-October, and since Prague was a major centre of alchemical and occult studies in the 16th century, have you got any recommendations for galleries or, or, or um, even the wonder there's, there's, lots, there's lots of the work of Archimboldo and Bartolomeo Spranger there. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Go for a treasury, because the treasury is going to be where you actually have the contents of um, Rudolf's Wunderkammer, where he kept all mm -hmm. sorts of precious jewels and minerals and so on, and that will be wonderful. And make sure mm -hmm. you do not go to the street of witches' houses, because I believe, I've never been, but I believe that is completely fake tourist trap. So the witches' houses mm -hmm. were, uh, I think, to be avoided, whereas the main museums will have lots of the art collection of Rudolf and his interest in uh, science and uh, the occult. And that, that includes the National Museum, does it? I'm not sure. Uh, the, there's the National Museum which will have the paintings. There may well be a separate treasury in a palace, but I don't know. I've never okay. been to Prague. I was going to go to Prague oh. in I was going to go to Prague in 1968, and we had a car and we were ready to go. And the <laughs> Russians got there about a week before we did, so we never went. Okay. okay. Fair enough. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Has anybody got any further questions, please? I've got a basic one. Uh, uh, Robert, you mentioned um, almost in passing the, uh, the idea of the studiolo. Yes. Could you say just a bit more about what that meant to, to the people? Who, uh, who are... That is, I think, simply Italian for a study. Yeah. And uiolo at the end means little study. Yeah. And uh, study is going to be your private place for thinking and researching. And this, uh, have you ever seen, have you ever been in that room? No, no. I mean, well, if you get the chance to go back to Florence, in the yeah. Palazzo Vecchio, you've got fantastic frescoes and so on, and lots yeah. of Michelangelo, but you've got this little chamber that you saw, and yeah. it's got these wonderful late 16th century Mannerist paintings in, and there are lots of books that have been written on the Medici and their interest in the occult, and in particular, this man, Francesco de' Medici, and uh, he was very strongly believing in an occult universe and he would have had this as his own private study room in which you would have kept books, manuscripts and then Wunderkammer which means all the minerals and the jewels and things like that and then all sorts of um, uh, tetramorphs and uh, all sorts of monsters and strange biological things and plants from the new world and there have been lots of books written on Francesco de' Medici and the Medici and the occult and I would guess you'd enjoy them a lot. So the idea is that as a wealthy man, you're at the centre of your own little universe, as it were. Uh, yes, again, I agree with you that um, yeah. the Wunderkammer was actually a re uh, You know about the concept of microcosm and macrocosm. Yes, exactly. And the yeah. way in which actually uh, you're living in a little world and you yes. can make the little world echo 
uh, yeah. the, uh, the universe as you understand it. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. We've got a question from um, Angela. Would you like to unmute yourself? Hello. Um, thank you very much. That was very interesting, um, your lecture. Could you just say a tiny bit about the Duc de Berry? Uh, yes. Uh, Duc de Berry was um, a son of the King of France. He was brother of later French kings. Uh, he was obviously immensely rich from the land and estates that you can see around his castles in the paintings. And he was um, a really interesting personality, which you can find out a lot about because of the various manuscripts that he collected. And people have done analyses of the uh, manuscript collection, and they come up with quite a strong idea of uh, what his character was actually like. Um, the paintings themselves are conventional. They are the normative way in which aristocratic intellectuals view the world. But in them, you see lots of details of scenes of courtly life. There are several which include feasts that are going on in his castle and there have been various interpretations where they are partly to do with luxury, they're to do with perhaps a new cult of voluptas, of um, being enjoying pleasure, and there have been even been people who've written articles and books where they look at the relationships going on inside the tables, inside the feasts in the Trevishoa, and they not only show men and women courting and making love, but they also show uh, various of the noble uh, Duke de Berry's court, uh, possibly with their boyfriends as well. And therefore, there's been lots of research into the kind of lifestyle that he was living. And he is creating a remarkable court culture. And it's very difficult to know how to characterize it. You usually talk about these as the pinnacles of late medieval art. But this is happening in 14, early 1400s, when you would assume that you were looking, uh, looking at some um, humanism going on in Italy uh, at the time. And the Duc de Berry, his manuscripts are mostly going to be religious and occult, rather than, as far as I know, humanist. So you've got a distinct division between the characteristics of the Italian and Northern Renaissances. Thank you. And where would we find that particular manuscript, that book of ours? Uh, Chanty. Uh, the Musée Condé at Chanty is well worth going to and uh, has that as well as uh, Leonardo, I think. But beware. In probably 1970, I was staying in Paris. No, in fact, earlier, when I was between school and university, I was staying in Paris and I made a special train journey to Chanty to go and visit the Musée Condé and to see the Leonardo and see the Trey Richer. And when I got there, I found that Chanty is also a center of horse racing. And therefore, the Musée Condé was closed for the day. <laughs> and I had to spend the whole day watching horse racing, which I hated and I've never watched since. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we've probably got time for one final question, if anybody has one. Okay, in which case, thank you very much, Robert, as always, the last half hour has both been informative and inspiring. And if like me, you're ready to sign up for the second in the series next week, then please do so by clicking on the forthcoming events link in the chat. And Robert will be talking about the changing beliefs about witchcraft expressed in art. Um, if you can't make it, uh, we will miss you, of course, but you can now catch up on all our talks, including Robert's first series on Impressionism, Expressionism and Abstraction from our video library on the website. Um, for ease, again, the link is in the chat facility. Um, and you will also find there a link to Robert's bursary if anybody would like to make a donation. As well as Robert's lunchtime talk next week, we welcome back 
former head Peter Winter on Wednesday evening, 23rd of September. So grab yourself a large glass of Bordeaux and tune in to hear Peter talk about his lifelong love of France, its people, the language and the culture. That brings us to the end of today's lunchtime lecture. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you, Robert, for keeping us engaged with your incredible knowledge, Tony, for your IT support. And I do hope that we see you all again very soon. Many thanks. Bye.